is your master class only for institutions ten billion dollars and less? Well, Rodrigo if you don't understand it, then we can't explain it to you. But <laughs> okay, can you get off the channel now? <laughs> for reals, Rodrigo, why? Come on. So the reason that we target that audience is because a lot of what we do is in the commodity complex, right? And so there is a liquidity constraint with regard to what any institution can do in real size on, on commodities. There is a CFTC limits uh, for um, asset manager. I mean, AQR is bumped up on, the, on that already and can't offer a lot of commodity-based um, features that they can on the institutional side. So that's kind of the sweet spot. You're not, we're not going to get an allocation from a hundred billion dollar or whatever pension plan and we, we, because we won't be able to implement it for them. So anybody, you know, we prefer the $10 billion threshold. Like let's, let's, you know, we'll manage your money at $10 billion, but beyond that, it would be difficult to implement. You know, you, you, there's a, there's a broader answer here, right? Which is that big institutions just don't have the liquidity sorry, like the, the portfolio agility or the mandate yeah. flexibility to be able to take yeah. advantage of active strategies, right? Like when you get into the, the tens of billions and hundreds of billions, you just can't run strategies on timeframes where the high sharp ratios live. So you've got to really just take advantage of long-term risk premium, right? So if you look at the Dutch pension plan, a lot of the major sovereign wealth funds, the major uh, state pension plans, large corporate plans, like they just don't run active strategies the way that we um, think about active, right? They well, think that, private equity infrastructure, basically long-term risk premium. That reminds me of, uh, and I think I've told, I've told you guys this story, but a, a meeting I had once with Norges Bank, which is Norway's sovereign wealth fund, which by the way, when they set up the meeting, I didn't realize was Norway's sovereign <laughs> wealth fund. I, it was for the week after I was supposed to get back from my honeymoon, and these people from Norges Bank email me and say, hey, we're going to be in town. We'd like to meet with you, uh, to which I was like, well, that seems like a Bank of America. So like, I just said to them, I was like, look, I'm coming back from my honeymoon. I don't have any time to prepare. I sit in the meeting with them. They, they then proceed to tell me they're the sovereign wealth fund of Norway. And I'm like, <laughs> probably should have prepared for this meeting. Regardless, I was never getting an allocation. It was just sort of an educational introduction. They had read some of the papers I had written. But they were telling me at that point they were starting a real estate investment. And to do it at a fund of their size, they had to hire a hundred people so that they could then scour the entire globe for real estate opportunities because for them to deploy that much capital, that's what it really took. Yeah. So to your point, yeah. you know, yeah. there's just these size limits that are beyond which it's hard to do much other than just beta. Uh, I, th I think it's, it's interesting too when I hear um, advisors, allocators, individual investors who are uh, smaller, obviously, and eschew the potential advantages that they have in being smaller um, asset pools to go pursue some super institutional approach where it's four hundred billion dollar funds. Like, well, does it make sense to give up the potential portfolio agility you have in smaller pools? And then, you know, some um, mandates have more um, mandate flexibility to some don't depend on a board right so if you have to maneuver through a board um, and then if your board has expectations around the return streams let's say it's a pension right so so there the actuarial side of it is there's a capital stack here that i need to assign a long-term risk premium to and i need to match that against the liabilities that i'm paying out and so what is the risk premium of your active tactical strategy that I can put to my actuaries? And the answer is there, there really isn't one. And so, or it, it's hard. Well, honest quants will tell you that there's a, there's a wide range and actuaries right. can, are, are able to use the empirical history of equity indices and bond indices and claim that those are the expectations where they, they right. can't do that with active strategies. And so there's yep. constraints. Thank you.